Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of New Books Network. This is your host, Morteza Hajizadeh from Critical Theory Channel. Today, I'm honored to be speaking with Dr. Uh, Kassas Kampurakis again. Uh, a few months ago, we talked uh, with each other about a fascinating book that he had published before. You can check his name on New Books Network, and you can check the previous podcast. This one is about a different book. The book we're going to discuss today is called Ancestry Reimagined, Dismantling the Myth of Genetic Ethnicities. The book was published last year by Oxford University Press. Kastas, welcome to New Books Network. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here again. Great. Um, Ancestry Reimagined. So let's talk about this. But before that... uh, can you please uh, tell us what made you decide to write a book uh, about dismantling this whole myth of uh, genetic ancestry and genetic ethnicities, as you uh, have put it in your in the title of the book? Yeah. Well, uh, in part, it was my father's quest uh, to discover, reveal our family tree, which was quite difficult, and which he did in a rather linear way. And I was trying to explain to him that this is a branching tree that goes back Uh, to many, many, many people uh, across time. Um, The other reason was in part that, you know, in Greece, we're proud of our cultural heritage that goes back many thousand years. But uh, at some point, I saw studies claiming uh, genetic continuity as well, which to me as a biologist seemed strange. So I decided to look into this topic in more detail, and uh, I I became very interested. So I ended up writing this book. (laughs) And I think it's very common these days. There are a lot of people who do these uh, DNA tests to figure out where they came from, who their ancestors are. Uh, and it has uh, both you know, personal, also at some point, political significance as well, which I'm sure we'll talk about. But um, to set the scene with this discussion, can you, you, in, you, in your first chapter, you make some distinctions between uh, different terminologies, such as ethnicity, race, nationality and ancestry. Can you tell us why this, um, let's say, this, 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 these distinctions are important? And can you tell us briefly what you mean by each? Yeah. I mean, these concepts are often easily confused and it is important to distinguish among them. Uh, the overarching one is ancestry. And as I explained in the, in the book, uh, there are actually different kinds of ancestry. We can get into that later. And usually... When we refer to a person's ancestry, we end up talking about the social groups to which that person belongs and to identities that come with it, which can be about their nationality, their ethnicity, or their race. Uh, Nationality is something that we acquire uh, at birth. We inherit it in some way from our parents, given their own nationalities. And this goes along with official documents like identity cards and passports. Um, whereas the other two are more cultural. Ethnicity usually relates to a language and a common cultural heritage. Uh, and so is race, that, but it also usually goes along with some biological features, which on average, can, we can say that are distinctive uh, in a broader sense of populations. Now, the question is, and this is what the book addresses, whether any of these can be identified by DNA? And the answer, uh, simply put, is no. Uh, or when it can be done, it, it is under many assumptions and at a very broad level. And I guess this is a perfect segue into my next question, because a lot of people try to identify their background, their, their race or ethnicity, let's say, um, and they go to DNA ancestry testing. And uh, can you tell us how it works, DNA ancestry testing, and how are the results used? And, and what's the point of all? I've never done that myself, but it's getting more and more popular. Yeah. So the companies uh, sell uh, these kits that ask you to spit in a tube or with a swab, take some cells from the inner part of your mouth and uh, send it to them. They extract the DNA from cells and they make uh, sequencing analysis. In some sense, they read the sequence of DNA and then they compare it to reference groups that they have, which are assigned to one or another. Uh, it used to be ethnic groups. Now, more recently, it has become geographical groups. And they tell you 
to which one you are more likely uh, to be similar with. And this is a key point. The whole thing is about similarity and the whole thing is quite relative because it all depends on one, the algorithm they're using for the analysis and the comparisons, which are not made public, and the reference groups that they have, which are mostly the previous test takers. The key point here is that there is no way that they could have a representative sample of uh, each population because the sampling is not exhaustive and because they do not um, make themselves the, the sampling. The sample is self-made by the people who submit their DNA for testing. The other point is that the results that they give you are the more the most probable ones. They tell you that you have this probability to be uh, that or the other uh, ethnic ethnicity or uh, racial group. But after these results, there are others which are not mentioned, which are the next most probable. Now, the funniest thing of all is that at least the two big companies, Ancestry, DNA, and 23andMe, they have white papers in which they explain all these. But I doubt that people, test takers, read these white papers, which are long and detailed. And at the same time, their marketing does not clarify these issues and the limitations with respect to uh, ethnicity and ancestry of these groups, of, excuse me, of these tests. Mm. And, and you mentioned it's not an accurate test anyway, because there are, in your book, and I do want to mention it for the benefit of the listeners, because in your book, there are lots of stories about stories and case studies, stories about different companies providing different results to the same person, or in some cases, even uh, twins have received different results. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that and why it's not that accurate and then maybe a story that you have around them? Yeah, well, this was uh, a show on uh, Canadian TV about uh, a journalist and her twin sister who took the same test with the same uh, companies. And even though they were monozygotic twins, which seems they came out from the same zygote and they practically have the same DNA, they got different results. They visited the scientists, Mark Gerstein and his group, to figure out why. And even the scientists themselves could not tell why. And they just said that they, this was not a result to be expected. But insofar as the algorithms of the companies were not available and the reference groups were not available, they could not tell why this happened. Uh, in my view, the simplest explanation is that exactly because these are probabilistic, uh, it so happened that the, 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 the analysis of practically the same DNA gave at two times uh, different results. Having said that, it's not that the tests are entirely inaccurate. They are quite inaccurate when it comes to ancestry. Nevertheless, they can be useful to people who have no clue about their ancestors. They can give some indications, some signs. And the most important part, which I discussed in the last chapter of the book, is that they're very accurate when it comes to close relatives because they're based on similarity. And even though they cannot tell you much about your remote ancestors, they can tell you a lot about your very uh, recent ancestors, which means parents, uh, grandparents, and uh, a few generations back. So uh, as I suggest in the book, the whole uh, enterprise should be rebranded as DNA family testing because this is what it is. And they can be very useful for those people who do not know much about their ancestors. But for those who do, uh, these people who know much about their history, who have met their parents and grandparents, it's better to listen to them about where they come from uh, that, rather than to the DNA tests. Which is also a cheaper option for them as well. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, you, what do you mean by essentialism when it comes to top? I'm curious to know the relationship between, for example, questions of nationalism and how DNA and ancestry companies define nationalities as genetic communities. And in this definition, you also bring up the idea of essentialism. So who are, what are these gen genetic communities? Yeah. Well, there are two aspects here. The first one is that there's a psychological intuition called psychological essentialism, and in this case, genetic essentialism, which makes us prone to think that groups are homogeneous and distinct from one another. We tend to intuitively identify underlying essences in whatever we see, 
it's a long discussion why this happens. It has to do with our um, tendency to think about uh, uh, organisms as artifacts designed for a purpose and uh, therefore having essences. Uh, but the important thing is that it comes intuitively to us. Um, now, the truth is that the people who have lived for generations in uh, a, a, the same geographic region tend to be related because they tend to mate with one another. And they tend to be more closely genetically to one another than to people who live far away. Under the assumption that people did not move that much until before Columbus, and the discovery of America, which is not accurate because people tend to move. It is just that since then they have been moving more. There is the assumption that uh, there were somehow pure populations with which then starting uh, interbreeding. And therefore, if we did this test going, I don't know, back, uh, analyzing histories going back to 500 years, we could figure out what kind of admixtures each one has. Uh, and in these cases where people were not admixed, but rather pure, because they had not their, their peoples had not interbred interbred with others, we could figure out the nationality of these people. These are the assumptions. However, the truth is that people have been moving around. The truth is that people have been interbreeding, not to the extent that they move nowadays, but still uh, globalization is not a new phenomenon. It, it always happened in some sense. It is just that it's very intensive today. And it is also wrong to think that, you know, until some point and until some recent point in history, we had pure populations that then started in the breeding. It is just that we had populations that were more isolated and populations that were less isolated. For instance, my country of origin, Greece, we have a distinct language and religion for the area. So this could make people a bit more isolated. We never had colonies since ancient times. In the, I mean, I'm talking about the 17th, 18th, 19th century, the way other European countries had. So in that sense, we could be a bit less admixed. But still, as I said, people have been moving and interbreeding all the time. And there's no way that we can define, you know, what is Greek DNA or Dutch DNA or French DNA and things like that. So all in all, it doesn't tell us much about uh, nationality, ethnicity in any, in any absolute sense. Mm -hmm. It can tell us a few things in some relative sense. I mean, if you compare a, a Portuguese person and a Spanish person to a Chinese, you can distinguish them from the Chinese, but it would be hard to distinguish the Portuguese from the Spanish person because mm. they are just, in relative terms, more related than to the Chinese person, because that person is more far away. But still, uh, we should not forget that 99.9% .9 of our DNA on average uh, for every human on this planet is the same. Mm. Yeah, and, and, and that even puts the question of race. Um, I mean, they also highlights the question of race, because whether it's a biological construct why, whether it's a biological thing or the social construct, because as you mentioned, uh, we, we, all, most of the humans all over the world share, um, they, they share, I mean, the DNA makeup is very much similar, most of them. It's not that distinct to create a new race, let's say. But yeah. again, I guess that's, how about, do you, do you happen to know that if in recent biological studies or recent scholarship, race is considered to be a, social construct or a biological reality? Most biologists and anthropologists argue that it is a social construct. There are some philosophers who still believe in a biological perception of race. In mm. my view, it is a social construct that has some biological indicators. Mm. Uh, mm. So we can tell someone from specific features on their face or their skin color that they are more likely to be from Africa or from Asia or from Europe. But this is not done in any absolute sense. It's, it is, again, probabilistic. But this doesn't tell anything about what is inside. If we had the sequences of DNA from people all over the world, we could not tell where they come from unless we looked at specific genes, for instance, related to skin color, and say that you know they may be, they may be more likely to come from that. But uh, this is not 
a, a, a criterion in any absolute sense. It can be an indicator which can work well. And actually, the ancestry test, when it comes to the continental level, uh, distinguishing between you know origins from Africa, Asia, Europe, America, they work well. But usually, we can tell that by looking at someone. <laughs> we don't need to tell to take a DNA test. Uh, this is, of course, stereotyping, but there are some features which are more common in some places than in others. And okay, we can make this distinction. But mm. there is no way that the DNA determines our race, and there is no way that we can say in any absolute sense uh, where that per where a person comes from from their DNA. It is always relative to what we compare them. And of course, a person with, for, for instance, Chinese origins is more likely to be more similar to Chinese people than, you know, to me or someone uh, from Africa. And uh, let's go back in history, in the 19th century. How did the idea of race become an integral part of the study of human populations in the 19th century? Well, at that time, uh, slavery was widely... Uh, uh, adopted in colonies. Uh, 19th century was a time when uh, the colonizers stopped having enslaved people uh, working for them, but some were not very happy with this. Uh, I mean, the civil war in the United States in part happened because of disagreements over that, and they were looking for a justification uh, to continue the exploitation of other people. Uh, many of them, as, for instance, in the United States, were religious, Christians, uh, and, you know, exploiting people is not good So, uh, for these religions. So one good justification would be to argue that the, the, what, the, per, the persons we are we ex were exploiting are not actually humans, are something that is less worthy than that. Uh, and this became a justification, bringing some of... Uh, uh, the groups uh, who were exploited, usually aborigines and uh, people from Africa, and, uh, considering them as su something like subhuman, immediately provided a justification to exploit them. In the same way, we exploit animals uh, for what we're doing. Uh, so my understanding was that you know this was a justification, a justification who uh, could make Christians still feel like a good good Christians while keep exploiting people. Uh, and uh, anthropologists made arguments about these by comparing skulls and showing, for instance, that African skulls were closer to those of primates than to those of uh, Europeans, and they used the ancient Greeks as the prototype, as the model, uh, which, of course, is strange, without realizing that, you know, for instance, human skulls and what at the time was described as a study of uh, uh, skulls craniometry uh, also depend on, in many ways, on uh, development, on what people eat, and not just their genes. But it was the way to go, until, of course, uh, it was shown later that, you know, there's nothing like that. Uh, a few minutes ago, we were talking about race being a biological or a social construct, and you believe that it's a social construct with some biological elements. So if, and the vast majority of biologists and anthropologists still believe it's a social contrast, co construct, as you rightly mentioned. But my question is, if it's that, so what's the role of DNA here? Is it not a criteria for, because I guess the whole point of that DNA testing is to define that criteria for, for race or an ethnicity. Yeah. As you explained in the, of the book, uh, DNA can be an indicator mm. of ethnicity. Uh, it may give you with some level of probability uh, an indicator of where you come from, which can be useful if you have no clue <laughs> where you come from. But if you know, then it doesn't give much information or it is very likely to give wrong information just because uh, the reference groups the companies have to which they compare your DNA are not correct, are not appropriate. Um, there are, of course, some other not very good surprises for people who take a DNA test and realize that the person who thought as their father is not the real father because they find that they don't have any um, shared DNA with them, uh, which, of course, happens for other reasons. But again, this is why I said that this is about family rather than ancestry. Having said that, there are biological differences among people, slight, but they exist, and they, in a broad sense, 
correspond to what we call race, like skin color. So that's why I say that, you know, some, some features are indicators, but you don't need to take the DNA test. You can tell from a person's skin color that he, she is likely to be from one or another uh, geographic region. Having said that, uh, things are not black or white. There is a continuum of colors. And I, I mentioned in the book an, an artist who photographed people and then uh, used her color palette to assign colors to them. And you can see that there are people from different races that actually have the same color, which is very funny and very interesting. That's why I say again that it is an indicator. It is something that uh, uh, exists. There are differences due to adaptations to different climates. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, there, there are people with darker skin color in Asia as well, not just Africa. And these differences can be identified. But I say once again, these are indicators. But they're not the criteria for being assigned in one race or another. Mm -hmm. and, you're, and you're right, I guess. It's because uh, you still see what it helps, I guess, major is, is in, in a major way, is simply to distinguish between, between different vastly different geographical locations for which you don't really need a DNA you know, test. Most of the time, it's just visible physical features. Uh, mm -hmm. um, you you have this interesting point in the book that these DNA tests, um, they tell us about the similarity among DNA sequences rather than similarities among DNAs in general. So how, how does that work? Well, they look for specific uh, sites on DNA and they make comparisons, and this is why they need complicated algorithms to make the calculations, because we're talking about thousands or millions of sites of DNA compares. And then they make a statistical calculation, and they give uh, you know something like an index of similarity, which then uh, assigns someone to the predefined groups they have uh, in, a, in a, a likely or less likely way. This is how it works. So they have, let's say, 20, 25 groups. They compare the DNA uh, of, that, of a person to the DNAs of all these groups, and they find similarities, more similarities in one group than another. And they tell people that you are 80% uh, of this group and 20% of this group, which actually means uh, that 80% of your DNA is more likely to be similar uh, for, with that group. But as I said, Behind that, there's another result, a second result, a second more probable result, which they never mention. The problem is that people think of their DNA when they read the results as a jigsaw puzzle, something that consists of different portions coming from different uh, parts of the world, without realizing that the further back we go in time, the more ancestors we have, two parents, four grandparents, eight great-grandparents, and so on, who, because of the way DNA is inherited and recombined along the way, give less and less and less DNA to us. So after 10 generations back, which is about you know, 300 years, uh, there will be several ancestors from whom we, we will have not received any DNA at all. We have 50% of, of each one of our parents, 25% of our, on average, of each one of our grandparents, 12.5% on average of each one from our great grandparents. And then as we go back, it gets less and less, which means that if we really want to talk about ancestry, there will be many, as we call them, as I call them in the book, ghost ancestors, people who are our genealogical ancestors, but they're not our genetic ancestors because we did not, we happened, it is entirely coincidental, not to inherit any DNA from them. And this is the big difference between genealogical ancestry and genetical an genetic ancestry. We have a huge number of genealogical ancestors going back in time, which end up being more than the people who have ever lived. But the reason is that the further back we go back in time, our family uh, trees uh, merge with one another and we have common ancestors. But from many of them, we have not inherited any DNA. And so even though they are our ancestors, this would not be indicated in our DNA. And this is why DNA cannot tell us who we really are, because it is a representation of only a small portion of our ancestors. However, it is a good representation of our recent ancestors, because it is from them that we have received what we have. 
And that's why we can get very good information about the recent ancestors, parents, grandparents, etc. I'm sorry, I, I, I cannot... Oh, sorry. Uh, we have a lot of interesting examples here as well. For example, uh, Hitler's executioner, Thomas Jefferson, and also the bodies of the, uh, the, the bodies that were supposed to be the family of uh, Romanovs, the Russian last czar. I know we won't be able to talk about all of them, but it would be good if you could, just to give the audience a, 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 an indication of content of the book, if you could talk about one of these cases to better yeah. illustrate this point. In some cases, the scientists were able to determine uh, who uh, the person, the, the relics of a person they found was. In other cases, it was not possible. The interesting story, I think, is Thomas Jefferson, because some people are convinced that uh, he was the father of uh, uh, the children of a lady that was uh, enslaved by him. Whereas if you look at the actual study, what the study shows is that a male member of the Jefferson family was the father, but we cannot know if it was really Thomas Jefferson. Why? Because the Y chromosome they checked, uh, the Y chromosome is shared by a father, his sons, his own father, the, the son's grandfather, and several other close male relatives. Uh, and so even though you can figure it out and say that one male of this family was the father, you cannot identify who that person was by that information only. So this shows that, you know, we can have some information about these events, which are relatively recent. They do not go far back in time, insofar as we can find people who live, have lived recently and compare them to what, to what, what we have. In that case, it was not possible to uh, say with certainty that it was Thomas Jefferson himself. But it is certain that it was a male person from his family. In the case of the Romanovs, things were quite uh, more clear because these are more recent events and they could make all kinds of comparisons. And they were able to identify most of the members of the family as who was who. Uh, it was, there was a difficulty with the girls because uh, uh, there was only one son and several sisters. There, they were not able to distinguish among each one of them. But overall, they were able to identify that that was the family. So uh, all in all, this is useful, but there are, there are limits to mm -hmm. what we can do. Yeah, yeah. And, and that brings me to my next question. So with DNAs, there are limitations. But as you mentioned, again, it's also an indication. But if it's the case, the DNA can actually show that DNA testing or DNA markers can show that all humans on Earth are similar or homogeneous or all humans on Earth are genetically distinct from one another. And uh, which is two kind of polar opposites here. But um, so what is the point of all this ancestry? Because if it's also based on geographical locations, at the end of the day, it's going to tell us that we are all Africans, which is also an argument in the book, which is well established now, I guess. Yeah, well, it all depends that, uh, on, uh, you know, whether we accept that ancestry is a relative concept. So where do, does my or your ancestry begin? 200 years ago or 200,000 years ago? Uh, it's, it's absolutely abstract uh, to set an origin point. And because of this, it is all relative. So if you decide to set the starting point, say, 200 years ago or 300 years ago for your or my ancestry, then you can f arrive at some conclusions. If you take it further back in time, we would say that all of us are Africans just because our species uh, evolved uh, in its current form in that continent and then spread out of that, uh, which is confirmed by all kinds of evidence, especially the fact that... Uh, the genetic variation within, Afri within Africa, we now know it is much higher than the genetic variation that exists outside Africa, just because all non-Africans of today uh, evolved, uh, emerged uh, from a small subset of Africans who at several times, you know, spread out. Of course, there have been people coming in, but overall, we are a, a species that is quite close and homogeneous in terms of genetic diversity. 
we may not like that or we may not understand how is that because we perceive um, superficial differences when we look at one another. But this is what DNA says. Um, the problem is that uh, because geneticists want to explore the differences, they focus on the tiny part where the differences are found because this is what they're interested in and it makes sense. But people don't realize that. Don't realize that scientists consciously overlook the similarities, but they know they're there to study the differences and see what conclusions they can make from them. But we should not forget that the similarities, the vast similarities exist. So despite all these limitations, um, my question is how or where can DNA ancestry be helpful? What can it offer us in a positive way? And I really like your argument towards the end of the book where you say that it can help us understand each other better in terms of relations rather than distinctions, relations rather than oppositions. This is a quite uh, a quite fascinating topic or way of looking at DNA testing to me. Mm -hmm. Well, what DNA ancestry testing shows and the analysis of DNA overall is that we are a huge family, all humans, mm. and there are no differences in that respect. Uh, there are some tiny differences that can be informative, and when it comes to DNA tests, it can be informative for people who do not know much about their families and their ancestors, for whatever reason. Mm. People who were adopted, people who, for whatever reason, didn't come to know their parents or grandparents and their families. Mm. Uh, the reason for this is that DNA tests can identify close relatives. And so imagine a person who has no clue about their family. If they put the DNA on a database and find matches, uh, the calculation can tell them the, the level of uh, um, how close the relative is. And, you know, they can get to know each other and learn more about the family and things like that. Mm -hmm. This, In this sense, it can be useful to these people. And this is why I, I keep saying that it is family, not ancestry testing. Mm -hmm. But for those who know their families, it doesn't have to say much, except for the cases we call, you know, false paternity. And the surprises, the bad surprises that may people may encounter when they come to find that the person they thought their father is usually the father uh, who is disputed um, is not the real one. But then, of course, uh, the question is, if a person brought up someone else, isn't that person the real parent? Uh, I mean, the biological connection is important, but we cannot <laughs> overlook, you know, the effort and the investment that someone gave to raising a child. Um, it is good to have both, perhaps. Uh, but, uh, you know, it is not just that the biological parent matters. Still, because we are intuitive and sensualist, mm -hmm. even though some people are indebted to, their, uh, to those parents who adopted them and raised them, they still want to get to know their biological parents because, you know, they feel this inner connection of the transmitted essence, which is the DNA. Mm -hmm. And... People should be prepared for the surprises when they take tests. And another aspect which I actually do not discuss much in the book is, you know, the fact that by providing your DNA, this may become publicly available and we have issues of, you know, who has access to that, who can use that. But this was a different story that I, do, I did not discuss much because mm -hmm. I was interested mostly in the misconceptions about ancestry. Mm -hmm. Thank you very, very much. I think uh, for me, the the most important lesson that I got from the book, there are lots of stories, as I said there, but it's it's that understand that that understanding of relationship rather than distinction, because most of us, when we do these ancestry testing, then despite all its limitations, we're looking for those distinctions. Okay, where do I fit? What is it that makes me different from others? But as, as you rightly mentioned in your book, this can help us actually understand the relationship rather than distinction, which is which is actually a concept that can unite us rather than divide, uh, which exactly. is, I guess, what is most needed these days as well. Yeah, um, and, uh, and who we are, if I may add, it has to do with our families, our, the way we're raised, our culture. I mean, I'm Greek because I was born in Greece. I was raised in Greece. Yeah. That's a language I speak. That's a culture I have. I don't need my DNA to tell me who I am. <laughs> and uh, I don't care what, what it says because uh, it is who I am who makes me 
the person I am, mm. independently of my DNA. I have no clue. I know for a fact, actually, I came to meet my three great grandparents. And I know for a fact that all of them were born and lived in Greece, but I have no clue what happened before that. Mm. I know from family stories that, you know, perhaps we are sure about certain about a couple of generations further back. Uh, but then who knows where they came from and what they did. Mm. But why would that matter? It doesn't yeah. matter. I'm, yeah. I'm proud of our, our culture and uh, our language and everything, as everybody should be proud of you know, their own culture and, uh, and mm. their family. But at the same time, we should not forget that independently of these differences, in terms of humanity, of DNA, of biological features, we're pretty much the same. And that's the important message. We are a huge family. Yeah, yeah, absolutely right. Uh, and on that positive note, uh, I, I'd like to thank you for your time to talk to us about your book. The book was called Ancestry Reimagined, Dispensing the Myth of Genetic Ethnicities. I do strongly recommend the book to our listeners. Lots of great stories and chapters in the book. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Kastas Kamparakis, to discuss the book with us here on New, New Books Network. Thank you very much for having me.